20-year-old Takahiko Ina was prepared to die. It was April 28, 1945, and he was making the final preparations for his first mission as a pilot in the Japanese Army, a mission that was designed to be his last. Once he took off, there would be no turning back. He had been trained to suppress his emotions and convinced to die for the honor of his country. He and his fellow kamikaze pilots had been ordered not to return. Instead, they were embarking on a one-way mission that would only end when they had crashed their planes into the side of an American battleship in a suicidal mission that he had been told would bring honor to his family and glory to him. And yet the young student couldn't help but wonder, what if a kamikaze pilot survived? By 1944, after nearly five years of brutal and bloody warfare across Europe, World War II had started to turn to the favor of the Allies in the European theater. After the D-Day invasion, they had repelled the Nazis from France in the West, and with the help of the Russians, the Allies were giving them hell on the Eastern Front too. It seemed like only a matter of time before the Nazis surrendered, but the war was not yet over for the Allies, particularly for the US, who had entered the war late and would go on to fight countless battles against the Japanese long after the war in Europe was over. The US had tried to stay out of the war, but Japan had forced their hand when on December 7, 1941, they launched a surprise attack on Pearl Harbor in Hawaii prompting the U.S. to enter the war in full force. Some of the bloodiest battles of the entire war would take place in the seas and sky of the Pacific Theater in the final years of the war as the U.S. turned their attention to making Japan pay for Pearl Harbor. Facing the full might of the U.S. military machine, the desperate Japanese needed a new way to fight the Americans, and so the legendary kamikaze was born. The word kamikaze means divine wind a reference to a fabled moment in ancient Japanese history when an unexpected typhoon saved Japan from a horde of Mongol invaders in 1281. The US, though, had another name for these fanatical fighters. They called them Baka Bombs, from the Japanese word Baka, which means idiot. Since the kamikaze planes were relatively easy to shoot down as they barreled directly toward the US ships, the US military couldn't wrap their minds around what would drive so many young Japanese men to sacrifice their lives in such a spectacular and final way. Still, the kamikaze were able to inflict some serious damage on the US and her allies. Though only about one in five kamikaze pilots managed to hit their targets, they succeeded in sinking 34 ships and damaging hundreds of others over the final years of the war. During the fierce Battle of Okinawa alone, kamikaze pilots were responsible for the deaths of 5,000 US Navy seamen, the greatest loss of life in a single battle in the history of the US Navy. The kamikaze tactics were also an effective form of psychological warfare. Every kamikaze mission was a suicide mission, and none of the thousands of kamikaze pilots who took to the air at the end of World War II were expected to return from their first and final flight. The US and her allies could not believe that so many young Japanese men were willing to take such drastic actions to defeat their enemies, and they lived in constant fear of the next desperate kamikaze attack. History remembers the kamikaze as fanatics who were honored to die for their emperor and their country, but those who survived tell a somewhat different story. In writing his 2008 book on the kamikaze, Danger's Hour, author Maxwell Taylor Kennedy had expected to find a story of fanaticism and fervent ideology among the kamikaze, but he was surprised by what his research uncovered. He found that the kamikaze were not unlike their American counterparts in their patriotism and self-sacrifice, calling them extraordinarily patriotic but at the same time extraordinarily idealistic. By design, kamikaze pilots were not intended to survive their first and only mission. And yet most of what we know about the kamikaze comes from those who survived and lived to tell their stories. So what happened if a kamikaze pilot survived? Some, like Hisao Horiyama, never had the chance to fulfill their glorious final mission and lived to share the real story of what drove thousands of kamikaze pilots to undertake their suicidal missions. Horiyama was 21 years old in late 1944 when he was pulled from his artillery battalion to join a new elite force of airmen. Japan was losing the war, and the kamikaze were an essential part of their last-ditch effort to turn the tide in their favor. Kamikaze missions were flying up until the very minute that the war ended on August 15, 1945. Young Horiyama was a devoted subject of his emperor, and he relished the opportunity to have his moment of glory in the name of his beloved country. Horiyama had completed his training and was preparing for his final glorious mission when the news came down that the Japanese had surrendered and the war was over. Though he was grateful that the emperor had ended the war, he was also regretful. I felt bad that I hadn't been able to sacrifice myself for my country, he told reporters in 2015 at the age of 92. My comrades who had died would be remembered in infinite glory, but I had missed my chance to die in the same way. I felt like I had let everyone down. 
How were the Japanese able to convince so many young men in their prime, like Horiyama, to willingly and even enthusiastically give their lives for their country in these suicide missions? In short, they were trained to die. An excerpt from the Kamikaze Training Manual illustrates just how thoroughly these young men were indoctrinated. It reads, When you eliminate all thoughts about life and death, you will be able to totally disregard your earthly life. This will also enable you to concentrate your attention on eradicating the enemy with unwavering determination, meanwhile reinforcing your excellence in flight skills. Honor is an extremely important part of Japanese culture, and kamikaze training focused on reinforcing this ideology and convincing these young men that their sacrifice would bring glory to them in the afterlife and honor to their families who they were leaving behind. Most believed that Emperor Hirohito and the nation of Japan were one and the same, and they were conditioned to be willing to die for him. They were trained to suppress all emotions and made to believe that they had been specially chosen for this sacrifice, a great honor in Japanese culture. In some cases, Emperor Hirohito himself would visit the kamikaze training school, attending their graduation ceremonies on a symbolic white horse, and personally requesting their services as kamikaze pilots. During their training, the pilots would practice the daring moves that would be required to complete their missions, repeatedly flying their planes almost vertically toward the ground to simulate crashing into an enemy target, before sharply reversing course just before crashing. These exercises prepared them for the day when they would follow through on their dive and plummet to glory and certain death. Their intense training was incredibly effective in convincing thousands of young Japanese men to sacrifice their lives for their country and die for a worthy cause. By the end of World War II, at least 2,500 pilots had given their lives in kamikaze missions. Many history books put the number closer to 4,000. At the end of their training, kamikaze pilots were given a slip of paper with three options on it. They could either volunteer passionately, simply agree to volunteer, or they could refuse, in theory anyway. Many survivors claimed that those who refused were simply told to try again and to pick the right answer next time. By the end of the war, the Japanese were desperate for troops. Up until that point, university students had been exempt from military service, but by 1944, many young scholars, like Takehiko Ina, found themselves drafted into Japan's new elite force of kamikaze pilots. 20-year-old Ina had been studying economics at the prestigious Waseda University when he was pulled from school and thrust into kamikaze training. Japanese culture places a high value on the firstborn sons, and thus they were exempted from the ranks of kamikaze to protect their family lines. Ina, as a younger son, certainly had his reservations about his kamikaze mission, but he welcomed the opportunity to bring honor to his family on a level uncommon for younger sons. Ina completed his training, volunteered to give his life for his country, and prepared to die, but fate had other plans for him. By the late stages of the war, the depleted Japanese were not only lacking troops but were using out-of-date and damaged aircraft that had been stripped down and adapted for kamikaze missions. These aging planes would turn out to be Ina's salvation. On his first attempt, his plane failed to take off, and Ina's suicide mission was over before it had even begun. His second attempt made it off the ground, but engine troubles forced him to make an emergency landing before he got anywhere close to his target. During his third and final attempt, more engine troubles forced him to land in the sea, and Ina and his two crew members had to swim to a nearby island where they were stranded for two and a half months. By the time they were rescued, the war was over, and Ina would never again have to prepare for certain death. Though the kamikaze trained to die, not all of them did. Those who returned fell into one of two groups, those who were forced to abort their missions due to mechanical troubles, weather, or failure to locate targets, and those who were unable to go through with their mission out of fear. The two groups were treated very differently by their superiors. Those like Ina, who were able to prove that they had returned for reasons beyond their control, were not punished. The Japanese could not afford to lose any pilots, so these kamikaze simply prepared to try again. Those who had backed out, though, were shamed and punished physically and mentally. Still, the depleted Japanese could not afford to lose even these reticent pilots, and the punishment was limited to ensure that the pilot could make another attempt. Even under these extraordinary circumstances, though, the Japanese military's tolerance had its limits. Surviving kamikaze pilots recall the fate of one pilot who returned from a total of nine final flights, each time unable to go through with his mission. After his ninth attempt, he was finally executed for cowardice. To combat this natural tendency to pull out at the last minute, the Japanese implemented a number of strategies designed to encourage pilots to go through with their deadly mission. Pilots flew in a squadron in the hopes that peer pressure would ensure pilots followed through with their mission, and kamikaze were even given some liquid courage prior to takeoff to help them ease their doubts. Some say that the planes were loaded with only enough fuel for a one-way trip to ensure there was no hope of returning, 
and each pilot was made to compose a will and a letter to their families prior to their last flight. The Japanese kamikaze pilots of World War II went down in history as the fanatical and deranged samurai of the skies, committed to dying for the honor of their emperor and country, and willing to give their lives for glory. In reality, though, they were not given any real choice in the matter, with most agreeing to volunteer at the risk of dishonoring their families and being sent to die in dishonor anyways on the front lines of battle. In a desperate last-ditch bid to turn the war back in their favor, the Japanese sent thousands of young men in their prime to die on suicidal kamikaze missions. Despite this, few kamikaze did return from their missions and lived to tell their stories. Thanks to them, we know that the kamikaze were not all fanatical or deranged, but instead were desperate and afraid of dishonoring their families if a kamikaze survived. The pilot takes a deep breath and prays. He sights his target and banks hard to the left. The engine roars under the strain of gravity. The target is lined up. The pilot pushes down on the flight stick. The plane dives toward the ocean below. Wedged in between the metal ring of the tachometer is a picture of the Emperor of Japan. Clutched tightly in the pilot's hand is a piece of cloth with his family's name embroidered on it. A feeling of calm washes over him as the battleship gets closer and closer and closer. Less than a year prior, the Japanese soldier sits in a large barracks with a bunch of his comrades. They're playing cards and smoking cigarettes. A veil of smoke fills the air as the soldiers enjoy some downtime after a campaign on a small island in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. The soldier has fought in several battles for the Emperor. His duty is to defend Japan against the Allied threat. He wears a freshly wrapped bandage around his shoulder where an enemy bullet lodged itself in the last battle. A high-ranking officer enters the barracks. All of the men immediately stand at attention. The commander walks up to the Japanese soldier and hands him a plain white envelope. In it is a folded piece of paper. The soldier takes out the paper and reads it. It's a letter directly from the Emperor. The letter asks the question, will you serve your country as a kamikaze pilot and bring glory to Japan? Below these words are three options, volunteer willingly, volunteer, or no. However, there is really only one option that any soldier can choose, unless he wants to bring dishonor upon himself and his family. The soldier checks the volunteer willingly box and hands the envelope back to the officer. The other soldiers congratulate him as he's about to make a great sacrifice for his country. He'll be a hero. The soldier packs his possessions into his standard issue tan sack and follows the officer out of the barracks. He's put on a transport to be taken to the closest air base where he'll be trained by the Japanese Air Force. The entire trip, the soldier thinks about what lies ahead. He thinks about the honor that being a kamikaze pilot will bring to his family, the sadness of not seeing his mother again, the pain of being engulfed in a fiery explosion. But to die for one's emperor is a privilege. The newly recruited kamikaze pilot reaches the air base where he'll be trained. He stands in a row of soldiers with the same determined look on their faces. He wonders if this is just a facade or does every one of these kamikaze pilots believe in doing the will of the emperor for the glory of Japan, even if it costs their lives. The soldiers stand at attention. The commanding officer announces that they're about to be in the presence of greatness. It'll be a privilege that so many others in the country only dream of. They're about to meet the Emperor. Emperor Hirohito rides down the dirt road on a white horse toward the newly recruited kamikaze pilots. The sun reflects off of his medals and sword. The horse gallops in a steady cadence reminiscent of the beats of a war drum. Hirohito stops just in front of the line of men. The soldiers look upon the Emperor, their eyes wide, trying to keep their resolve even though they're filled with admiration and awe. Emperor Hirohito tells the kamikaze pilots that it is their duty to bring honor to Japan. He's requesting their service personally. This is a special request, because the Emperor is the embodiment of the country. He is practically a deity. Hirohito leaves and the soldiers are left with their thoughts. They're put through training and tests to teach them basics for flying a plane before the more technical training begins. The soldier has learned from talking to the other kamikaze recruits that, like him, many of the kamikaze pilots went to Japan's best universities before the war. The Emperor isn't just sacrificing the lower classes to the war machine. Instead, some of the most intelligent people in the country are being put into planes loaded with explosives in order to give their lives for Japan. The soldier sits in a classroom with old wooden desks and chairs. The officer at the front of the room teaches lessons around suppressing fear and other troublesome emotions. The soldier is to maintain a clear head and do his duty. That's it. There's no need to worry or be nervous because this is the kamikaze pilot's destiny. There's nothing more important than serving the nation. The officer explains that even if the soldier were to die, it's for a worthy cause and will be the ultimate fulfillment of duty. The lesson ends with the officer commanding the kamikaze pilots in the room to carry out their mission 
or do not return. The soldier wonders if by some miracle he were to survive the mission, what should he do next? His commanding officer just gave him the order not to return, so if he survives, can he go home? Weeks of training go by and the soldier is no longer considered a recruit. He's now a kamikaze pilot and will be given his final mission soon. Before his final flight across the Pacific Ocean, the kamikaze pilot is asked to write a letter to his parents. It'll be delivered when his mission is completed. He sits silently looking down at the blank piece of paper. He takes a deep breath and writes seven words that will be delivered to his mother and father upon his death. I have brought honor to our family. The kamikaze pilot folds the piece of paper and places it inside the envelope. On the way out of the barracks, he hands it to his commanding officer. He looks out across the airfield. The tarmac radiates heat. The smell of gasoline fills the air. Mechanics work on engines as soldiers help mount the explosives to the kamikaze planes. The roar of engines is deafening. The airfield is a conglomerate of older plane models. These previously retired planes are now used for one thing, getting loaded with extra fuel and explosives and flown into the side of allied targets. The kamikaze pilot walks toward his aircraft. It's an old fighter plane with a rusty propeller and chipped paint across the fuselage. He runs his hand along the wing, thinking about how this will be the last time he stands on the ground of his homeland. Soon he'll be in the air, and then sent to whatever comes after this life. The pilot grabs onto the warm metal railing of the ladder leading to the cockpit. He climbs halfway up and turns his head to watch his comrades running to their aircrafts and preparing to take off for their final mission. He feels a sense of duty but also a pain in his heart that he'll never be able to have a family of his own. He releases a sigh and continues to climb. The kamikaze pilot swings his legs over the side of the cockpit and slides into his seat. The flight stick is a little wobbly and the glass on several of the dials is cracked. This plane must have been retired years ago, maybe even before the war had started. He slides the canopy over his head, enclosing himself in the cockpit. The canopy glass has become murky from oxidation in time. The kamikaze pilot looks out at the airfield one last time. He pulls out the choke and signals to the mechanics to start the engine. They pull down hard on the propeller. Nothing happens. The pilot cranes his neck to look at the mechanic. He reaches up, grabs the propeller, and pulls down again with all his strength. The engine roars to life. The propeller turns for a few seconds, and then the engine dies. Could this be a sign, he thinks? He's heard stories of kamikaze pilots being ready to carry out their missions, but the planes wouldn't start. The older modeled aircrafts were stripped to their bones so they could be loaded with more explosives, but very little work was put into maintaining the plane's engines or machinery. The kamikaze pilot sits in the cockpit. He's filled with a mix of emotions. On the one hand, if the plane doesn't start, he'll get to spend more time in the land that he loves. On the other, he'll not be doing his duty to that very country. It's an internal struggle that many kamikaze pilots have to deal with. Another mechanic runs over to the plane with a wrench in his hand. The two mechanics begin frantically working on the engine. The pilot watches as plane after plane takes off from the runway and flies over the dark blue waters of the Pacific. Suddenly, there's a deafening bang. Smoke bellows out of the engine. The propeller begins to turn. It turns faster and faster, the engine hums to life, and the pilot pulls back on the throttle. The engine's making a gurgling sound and every minute or so spews out black smoke, but the mechanics give the pilot a thumbs up and remove the parking blocks from the tires. He's ready to go. The plane moves toward the runway. He waits for the signal. When it's given, he pushes the throttle to full. The engine roars. Smoke pours out of the exhaust pipes. The plane lurches forward, pushing the pilot back against his seat. He pulls back on the flight stick and the plane rises into the air. He moves toward his squadron and glides into place. They are now airborne and flying toward their target. The fleet of ships they're going to intercept is not too far off the coast of Japan. The time to contact is only a couple of hours. About halfway into the flight, the pilot watches as several of the planes in the squadron run into mechanical problems and plummet into the depths of the ocean. Eventually, the fleet appears on the horizon. They're battleships, destroyers, and an aircraft carrier. They look like little toys in an endless bathtub. The pilot grips the flight stick tighter. This is it. This is what he's been trained for, and this is what the Emperor demands. He'll finish his mission and bring honor to his family and country. The squadron of planes begins to descend. There are bright flashes of light coming from the fleet of ships. The sky is filled with explosions from anti-aircraft shells. The planes dodge and weave around fiery shrapnel and clouds of smoke. The kamikaze pilots are almost directly above their targets. Planes begin taking off from the aircraft carrier to try and intercept as many of the kamikaze aircraft as possible. The Allied forces are well aware of the kamikaze tactic by now. The more desperate Japan becomes, the more dangerous the war gets. They've been planning and putting countermeasures into place. However, if a single kamikaze pilot makes it to its target, the damage can be immense 
The pilot pushes his flight stick forward. The plane goes into a nosedive. He looks to his left and sees one of the other planes blown from the sky by an anti-aircraft shell. He looks to the right and sees a missile that's been deployed from one of the larger aircrafts. He knows that inside this missile is a man and a ton of explosives. The pilot has been crammed inside the missile with no means of getting out since the device was mounted to the plane back at the airbase. The kamikaze missile will free fall for as long as possible, then at the last moment the pilot will engage the thrusters of the missile and he'll maneuver it to his target. The missile is slender and smaller than an aircraft, therefore it's much harder to destroy. The pilot turns his head to look straight through the cockpit windshield. He takes a deep breath and closes his eyes. The battleship he's flying toward gets closer and closer and closer. During World War II, Japanese kamikaze pilots were revered as heroes by their country and deemed an enormous threat by the United States military. These pilots were willing to give up their own lives to serve their country. The word kamikaze means divine wind. We know about how kamikaze missions were used by the Japanese in battles like Pearl Harbor or at naval installations in the Pacific from survivors of such attacks. We also know about the kamikaze pilot experience from individuals who encountered mechanical issues with their planes and were unable to complete their missions. By the end of World War II, almost 4,000 Japanese pilots died in kamikaze missions. It's still disputed how effective these missions were in terms of damage to Allied ships and bases. Kamikaze missions continued all the way up until the end of the war when Emperor Hirohito announced Japan was surrendering on August 15, 1945. Over the years, the Japanese people have viewed the kamikaze pilots with mixed feelings. Some saw them as heroes who were doing their duty during a time of war. Others saw their acts of suicide as shameful. Either way, the life of a kamikaze pilot must have been a difficult struggle between giving up one's life and doing their duty for the glory of the country. This was an internal battle waged within each kamikaze pilot during World War II. Kayoshi looks out of the cockpit window. Flying next to him are his kamikaze comrades. Many of them bask in the glory of being able to sacrifice their own lives for their emperor and nation, but Kayoshi doesn't want to be here. He thinks about his mother back home and how he will never see her again. Suddenly, there's an explosion in the sky. The plane next to him explodes into flames and hurtles toward the ocean below. The man flying it was one of his best friends. Kayoshi looks down and can see the flashes of anti-aircraft guns firing from the American fleet. He takes a deep breath and shoves his flight stick forward. His plane speeds toward a battleship as he prays for some kind of divine intervention to save his life. When he opens his eyes, he can just make out the sailors on the deck of the ship diving for cover as his plane hurtles toward them at 260 miles per hour. Then everything goes black. Just over a month ago, Kayoshi woke up on a warm August morning in 1944. He stretched as he got out of bed and walked into the kitchen to pour himself a cup of hot tea. Before going into town to run some errands, his mother made a pot. Kayoshi had just celebrated his 17th birthday and was getting ready to attend his second semester of university in the coming weeks. Most of his friends had volunteered for the army and were deployed around the Pacific to aid Japan in their expansionist efforts and destroy the Allied threat in the area. Kayoshi flipped through the pages of his newspaper on the table. Almost every story was about the ongoing war or interviews with Emperor Hirohito. He explained that it was the duty of every Japanese citizen to help Japan defeat the enemy threat. To the Japanese people, the emperor was the living embodiment of a god, and there was no higher honor than serving him. Kayoshi loved Japan, but his favorite teacher had taught him the importance of critical thinking. He wasn't sure he believed everything the emperor said, but he would never admit that to his mother or to anyone else who blindly followed whatever Hirohito said. Today's paper was full of anti-American propaganda and a call to arms. This had been all that was printed for the last several years, ever since Japan launched its attack on Pearl Harbor about three years ago and dragged the nation into World War II. There had been very little else anyone talked about. The newspaper was filled with national rhetoric and explained how it would only be a matter of time until Japan would be victorious. Kayoshi had seen countless boys from his region head off to war years ago and never return, so it seemed as if victory might be further away than the press was making it out to be. Kayoshi shook his head. What is the world coming to, he thought. Kayoshi sighed and threw the newspapers into the garbage. He took out a heavily read copy of Kokoro by Natsume Soseki and he began reading it for the 18th time. The story of the young man and his sensei reminded Kayoshi of his own relationship with his favorite professor at the university. He hadn't gotten very far into the first chapter when his mother burst through the front door. Kayoshi, she called. He put down his novel and walked to the next room. His mother was holding a white envelope. A look of pride filled her face. This came for you today. It's from the emperor. Kayoshi's heart sank. There could only be one message sent to him from the emperor. He was going to be forced to join the military. 
Kayushi slowly reached out and took the letter from his mother. She smiled at him and placed her hands on his shoulder. I am so proud of you. You will be following in your father's footsteps by serving the Emperor's army. If dad were still here, I am not sure he'd agree with you, replied Kayoshi. His mother's smile turned into a frown. Your father did his duty for Japan. The war cost him his life, but he died honorably. Kayoshi disagreed, but nodded his head up and down anyway. He looked at the white envelope and opened it. Inside was a piece of paper with a short paragraph about what an honor it would be to serve the Emperor. It also explained that he would be joining a new contingent of elite soldiers who would be given a special mission. They would be known as kamikazes, or the divine wind. Below the message, there were three options that Kayoshi could choose from. They were to volunteer willingly, to simply volunteer, or to refuse the invitation to serve the emperor. Kayoshi desperately wanted to refuse, but he knew it was not an option. His mother would disown him, the university would expel him, he would be cast out and shunned by his village. Simply volunteering wasn't an option either. He had to willingly volunteer, whether he liked it or not. His loyalty would be questioned. Kayoshi picked up a pen resting on the table and marked an X in the first box. He kissed his beaming mother on the forehead, turned around and proceeded into his room to pack his bag for the trip to the military recruitment center in the nearby city. When Kayoshi arrived at the military base, he gave his letter to the officer sitting behind the desk. The man looked it over, glanced up at Kayoshi, and reached out his hand. You're going to serve the emperor and make your country proud, the officer said as he shook Kayoshi's hand. He gave Kayoshi a uniform and instructions to head out to one of the barracks on the base, where he would meet others who had been recruited to be kamikazes. Kayoshi walked to the barracks where the young men like himself were talking to one another in hushed tones. Everyone was waiting for the commanding officer to come in and explain to them exactly what their special mission would be. Kayoshi set his stuff down and kept quiet as the other men chatted. Another cadet named Haisao approached Kayoshi. This is exciting, said Haisao. We finally get to serve our emperor and aid in the glorious expansion of the Japanese empire. Kayoshi just nodded his head. At that moment, the doors burst open. A man dressed in an officer's uniform covered in war medals walked in. You all have been chosen for a special mission, the general declared. There's nothing more honorable than sacrificing your life for the emperor. That is why being a kamikaze is one of the most elite positions in the Japanese military. You will be tasked with flying heavily armed aircraft into key targets to destroy them and deal a fatal blow to the enemy. The men in the barracks looked at one another uncertainly. Most knew it was their duty and would do as they were told. Others were less enthusiastic about the thought of being sacrificial weapons used to damage enemy targets. Kayoshi couldn't believe what he was hearing. Now more than ever, he wanted to run away, but where would he go? He couldn't return after deserting the military. His mother would disown him. His friends would turn him in. It seemed as if the entire country had gone mad. The general gave the cadets their orders. They would be shipped out to a nearby Japanese Air Force base for training. Kayoshi had never been in a plane, let alone flown one. This was his duty, but if he refused, his life would be over. The young Japanese soldiers gathered their belongings and proceeded out of the barracks, where a transport vehicle was waiting for them. This is exciting, Haisao exclaimed. The emperor says the kamikaze are the future of Japanese warfare. I heard the great commander Motoharu Okamura's exact words were, I firmly believe that the only way to swing the war in our favor is to resort to crash dive attacks with our planes. There is no other way. Provide me with 300 planes and I will turn the tide of the war. Kayoshi just smiled and kept his mouth shut. He hoped that if he kept his head down and followed orders, the war might end before he or any of the men in his new squadron would be sent to their deaths by power-hungry generals. The group of soldiers hopped on board the idling transport vehicle and left the base. They drove for several hours before an airfield appeared on the horizon. Kayoshi lost himself in a daydream of peace. He was brought back to reality when the truck hit an exceptionally large bump and his head hit the ceiling. He looked out of the vehicle just as it passed through the gates to the airfield. The guards waved to the men on board the transports as they proceeded down the dirt road and toward one of the hangars at the far end of the tarmac. The truck pulled into the hangar and came to a stop. The commanding officer ordered all of the men out of the vehicle. There was someone who wanted to talk to them. Kayoshi climbed down from the back of the truck and formed a straight line across the entrance to the massive hangar with the rest of the cadets. They could see a cloud of dust rising at the far end of the base. It got closer and closer until Kayoshi could make out the silhouettes of the men riding horses coming toward them. Stand at attention for your emperor, men, the commander shouted. Everyone stood up as straight as possible. They couldn't believe their eyes. As the dust settled, the kamikaze recruits looked upon Emperor Hirohito of Japan. He rode a brilliantly white horse and was flanked by his generals. The mission you're about to embark on is one of the utmost importance, the emperor said. You have been selected to train for one of the most elite units in all of the Japanese military. You will sacrifice your life for country and for me. When you do this, you will be rewarded greatly. You are invincible, and as long as you do your duty, you will make me and your nation proud. Your sacrifice will strike fear into the hearts of the enemy. 
Follow your commander's orders and remember what you fight for. The men looked wide-eyed at the god king and hung on every one of his words. Kaioshi kept his eyes forward but felt a sickening feeling fill his stomach. Until this point, he thought he would be enlisted to aid in the war, but now the emperor was telling him that his sole duty was to sacrifice himself to kill others. Hirohito looked at each one of the kamikaze recruits and nodded his head, then he rode off. The recruits were put through basic combat training each morning and flight training in the afternoons. Kaioshi and the other men would breathe in the fumes of aircraft all day as they prepared for the missions ahead. When he went to bed at night, Kaioshi would have nightmares and awake covered in sweat. They always seemed to consist of men screaming and fire consuming his body. The flight training started with the recruits being brought into the skies over Japan by a trained flight instructor who would carry out different maneuvers to ensure that the kamikaze cadets could withstand the motion and the g-forces that were exerted on their body during flight. It would do the emperor no good if his kamikaze pilots passed out while en route to their target. Kaioshi looked out of the cockpit window at the landscape below. Japan was a beautiful country, but how long would it stay that way? Eventually, the war would reach the shores of the island, and then it would be consumed in fire and death just like the other parts of the Pacific that served as battlefields. After several days of training flights, it was time for the future kamikaze pilots to get behind the stick of the plane. Kaioshi watched as one of the other recruits entered the cockpit. The engine roared to life. Each soldier was given a notepad to write their thoughts and improve their skills. The Mitsubishi Kai 51 raced down the runway. Its engine screamed as it approached the necessary speed for liftoff. The wheels left the ground, however only a few moments later the engine stalled and the plane plummeted back to the ground. The impact caused the wings to rip off and the fuel tank to ignite. Kaioshi and the other trainees watched in horror as one of their fellow kamikaze pilots was consumed by fire before he even got a chance to reach the battlefield. The aircraft they were training on were older models that had been stripped to the bones. The Japanese military couldn't afford to let these new recruits practice on state-of-the-art aircraft that were needed for the war effort. When they launched their mission to destroy enemy targets, they would also be using older models, except those would be loaded up with explosives. The Japanese command thought it was a good idea for the recruits to train and learn the quirks of these older aircraft before heading into battle. This decision would cost the lives of several of their young cadets. The commanding officer returned from the wreckage to inform the other kamikaze recruits that their comrade had been lost. But since he was serving the emperor, it was still a glorious death. Without giving the soldiers a second to mourn, the CO asked who wanted to go next. Several hands immediately shot up, but far less volunteered than prior to the crash. The training continued for weeks. Kaioshi barely got any sleep. He would think about his mother back home and how proud she looked when he went off to the recruitment center with his letter of acceptance. He thought about his university and how he would never be able to return to it. And then he thought about death. The recruits were trained to suppress their fears and emotions, but Kaioshi couldn't help but dread what was to come. Almost every one of the other kamikaze pilots had accepted their fate, but he wasn't sure he could. He didn't feel that this ultimate sacrifice would make much of a difference in the war, even if everyone else did. After a little over a month, the orders came in. The first kamikaze squadron ever to be deployed was called upon to attack an enemy fleet that was anchored in the Leyte Gulf off the coast of the Philippines. Kaioshi and the other pilots had finished their training, and now it was their duty to deal a defeating blow to the Allied forces. Up to this point in the war, there had been no intentional kamikaze attacks. This one would be calculated and precise. The mission of the men in Kaioshi's unit wasn't to drop bombs or shoot the enemy aircraft out of the sky, it was to fly their airplanes directly into the targeted ships. They wouldn't be coming back from this mission, so their commanding officer had each of them write a letter home to their families. Most of the men told their parents that they loved them and would miss them, but they had been called by a higher power to defend the country and serve their emperor. Kaioshi wrote this to his mother. Dear Ma, I'm about to be sent on a mission I will not come back from. I know it is my duty to serve the Empire. I will miss you, and the thought of leaving you all alone breaks my heart. I hope the war ends soon, and you and everyone else in our nation can find peace. Your son, Kaioshi. After he finished the letter to his mother, Kaioshi quickly wrote a note to his professor at the university. This letter voiced how he truly felt. Dear Sensei, the war is about to consume me as it has consumed so many Japanese lives. I can't help but feel that fighting with one another is pointless and that if we used our words instead of our weapons, the world would be a better place. As Natsume Soseki says in Kokoro, words are not meant to stir the air only. They are capable of moving greater things. Your loyal student, Kaioshi. Kaioshi knew that all the communications would be read though and that this letter likely would not make it to his professor due to its anti-war message. But he felt better after writing it. He sealed both letters into separate envelopes and dropped them into the wooden box on the way out of the barracks. The kamikaze pilots were loaded onto a carrier plane and flown to Davao in the Philippines. This would be where their mission would launch from. 
On October 25, 1944, Kyoshi and the other pilots gathered into the tarmac and Davao to await their final orders. The Kamikaze fleet was mostly made up of Mitsubishi Kai 51s, but had a few larger Yokosuka D 4Y planes mixed in. Engineers swarmed the aircraft, making sure that the bombs were secured and the extra explosives would detonate upon impact. Kyoshi couldn't help but think that they looked like worker bees preparing their hive for an invasion. He was pulled from his thoughts as an officer shouted the command for all kamikaze pilots to get to their planes and prepare them for flight. Kayoshi and the rest of the men ran across the tarmac to their assigned aircraft. They climbed into their cockpits and began pre-flight checks. The fuel tanks were filled to capacity so that when the plane slammed into its target, the gasoline would add a little extra power to the explosion. The engineers finished their final preparations and gave the pilots the all-clear. The soldiers, workers, and generals stationed at the airbase saluted the pilots as they took off. They all had immense respect for the sacrifice these men were about to make. Kayoshi looked at the plane to his left, where Haisao sat in the cockpit. They locked eyes. Haisao gave him a stern look and a bow of the head. These men felt very differently about the kamikaze program, but where Kayoshi was forced into it by social pressures and the threat of dishonor to his family, Haisao had been looking forward to this day for a long time. Haisao was most definitely the norm while Kayoshi was the odd man out in this circumstance. Almost every Japanese citizen would be willing to give their life for their emperor and country. Kayoshi throttled up the engine, the plane lurched forward and then accelerated to top speed. He pulled back on the flight stick and took off. The kamikaze squadron raced toward the Allied warships that had just disengaged the Japanese fleet in the Leyte Gulf. The enemy fleet came into sight. The Battle of Leyte Gulf would go down in history as one of the largest naval battles ever to occur, but it would be what happened in the sky that the world would remember long after the waves of war had settled. The hum of the engine filled the cockpit. Kayoshi looked down at the turquoise green waters of the Philippine Sea. He thought about making up an excuse to turn around and head back to base. Maybe he could claim his aircraft was experiencing an engine failure and return to get it fixed. When he landed, he would immediately run away and disappear into the jungles of the Philippines before anyone found out he was lying. But Kayoshi knew that if he was discovered and captured, not only would he be tortured and put to death for desertion, but the dishonor his mother would face would surely break her heart and kill her. Kayoshi bit down on his tongue so hard it bled. He tried to remain focused on the mission. He told himself this was war, and everyone involved knew exactly what they were signing up for when they joined the military. Suddenly, an explosion brought him out of his thoughts and back to the task at hand. The first kamikaze squadron had reached its target. Kayoshi watched as smoke filled the sky and his comrade's planes exploded in flames. A crackling voice came over the radio. The lead plane signaled that it was time to strike. The front of the kamikaze squadron began to descend toward the Allied warships below. Kayoshi took a deep breath and closed his eyes. When he opened them, he had to bank hard to avoid the mangled metal hull of one of the other Japanese planes that had been hit by an enemy shell. He straightened out the flight stick and lined up to his target. Kayoshi's mission was to slam his plane into the hull of one of the battleships in the middle of the fleet. He watched as the first few planes struck the enemy ships and exploded in fiery infernos. He wondered if the men on board could understand why so many were willing to sacrifice their own lives in service to their own country. Did the Americans think the way the Japanese did? Or could they never understand the blind devotion these men had to their emperor? Kayoshi looked around him and noticed that his was the only plane that had not dove yet. He thrust the flight stick forward, the plane descended toward the ocean. Kayoshi continued to dodge the firestorm coming from the Allied fleet. His target got closer and closer. He could now make out the men on board the ship running in a panic as they realized the true purpose of this attack. Kayoshi focused his sights on the hull of the ship even though he wanted to pull up and avoid the impact. It was too late now. He closed his eyes and thought about his mother. Forgive me, Kayoshi said out loud. Then his plane struck the vessel. It exploded on impact, instantly killing Kayoshi and dozens of American sailors. The first planned kamikaze attack of World War II had just occurred. Allied sailors who survived couldn't comprehend what had just happened. They desperately tried to put out the flames and rescue anyone who survived the onslaught as ships in the fleet sunk to the bottom of the ocean. Somewhere between 2,800 and 3,800 kamikaze pilots either slammed their planes into Allied targets or were shot out of the sky during the war in the Pacific. It's estimated that Japanese kamikaze planes sunk at least 47 Allied vessels and damaged around 300 others. Over 7,000 Allied sailors and soldiers were killed as a result of kamikaze attacks. At the time, Japan claimed these suicide missions were much more successful than they actually were. Many Japanese military leaders believed that kamikaze missions would turn the tide of the war. They exaggerated the effectiveness of the tactic, which cost thousands of lives and had little effect on the war. Most Japanese citizens would have willingly laid their lives down for the emperor and the country. The masses truly believed Emperor Hirohito was a god, 
and would have fought until the last person if given the choice to either surrender or die. However, like the fictional story of Kayoshi, there were some kamikaze pilots and Japanese citizens who questioned what they were doing. Some kamikaze pilots survived their missions due to malfunctioning equipment, and later went on to reflect on the messed up nature of the kamikaze program. They realized how they had been manipulated by the emperor and military leaders. Others deliberately deserted the kamikaze fleets and hid until World War II was over. In the past few weeks, the war in Ukraine has escalated again, with Russia attacking a range of targets across the country, including the capital, Kyiv. One deadly and terrifying part of this new wave of attacks has been the use of so-called kamikaze drones to blow up both energy infrastructure and civilian targets. But what do we actually know about these drones? Where are they coming from? And what does their use mean for war in Ukraine? Officially called the Sahed-136, or in Russian, the Geron-2, these drones were developed and manufactured by the Iranian government. Only entering service last year, the Sahed-136 is a triangular-shaped autonomous drone which dives toward its target and explodes on impact, destroying everything around its crash site. Each drone is about 11 feet long, weighs 440 pounds, and carries a roughly 88-pound warhead. Typically fired five or more at a time from a launch rack mounted on the back of a truck, they reportedly have a range of over 1,500 miles. This means they can be launched far from the front line of a conflict and are able to loiter around a particular location for hours at a time, attacking only when their target is located. Ukrainian officials have stated that the drones are being fired from three Russian bases in Crimea and another position in Belarus. But these drones are also relatively slow, noisy, and fly at a low altitude, making them easy targets for both traditional air defenses and even armed individuals. To get around this problem, they rely on numbers, with several Sahed drones usually striking at an area at the same time. This has proved difficult for Ukraine to counter, as even if one drone is destroyed, several more will likely still reach the target. Since the 10th of October, Sahed drones have played a major part in destroying nearly a third of Ukraine's power stations and killing dozens of civilians around the country. But why is Russia using these drones? There seems to be multiple reasons. First, their use might be a sign that Russia's military is running low on its traditional precision-guided ballistic and cruise missiles, which were used to damage the power grid, ammunition depots, and other strategic Ukrainian targets. Sahed drones have allowed Russia to continue this practice even as its military continues to lose ground in the south and northeast of Ukraine. The drones are also important because Russia has so far failed to establish air superiority, putting its manned aircraft at a huge risk when flying into Ukrainian territory. Since Sahed drones are autonomous, Russia can still achieve its goals of destroying targets deep behind enemy lines without risking its dwindling supply of pilots. Finally, Sahed drones are relatively cheap weapons, costing between $20 and $50,000 each. This makes them ideal for Russia, whose economy has been seriously harmed by sanctions and the growing cost of its invasion. But does this low cost mean that these drones don't pack the same punch as conventional smart weapons? While the Sahed drone's 88-pound payload is quite small by military standards, their precision targeting makes them potentially devastating. In combat, they can explode near weapons, ammunition, or other combustible materials to greatly increase their damage. They also have created a new risk for Ukrainian forces, which had grown used to dealing with Russian missiles and artillery strikes. In contrast, the drone's targeting is much more unpredictable, and Ukraine only recently announced that it was able to shoot down a majority of them. The drone's extreme portability also makes them a dangerous and unpredictable threat. A truck full of Saheds can engage in hit-and-run tactics by launching them and then leaving the area before a retaliatory strike can take place. Finally, even if the drones are destroyed over major cities, they can still cause major collateral damage when they fall to the ground. All of these features make the Sahed-136 a cheap but extremely powerful weapon, especially since the financial toll of destroying a drone vastly exceeds the costs of each one. But with all these sanctions placed on Russia, who has been brave enough to supply them with the weapons? The answer is Iran, but the reasoning behind this dubious collaboration might be worrying. Although the two countries have not always been friendly with one another, in the 21st century they are united by their hatred for the West. Bad news for those who thought that Russia will run out of weapons. Their current cooperation goes back to 2015, when Russia used its air force to intervene in the Syrian civil war. Iran was also involved in the conflict, supplying weapons and training to paramilitary groups. Together, the two countries worked to prop up their mutual ally, Syrian dictator Bashar al-Assad. Russian warplanes and Iranian-backed ground troops successfully kept Assad in power while also acting as a slap in the face to Western countries. The war in Ukraine has provided another opportunity to work together, as Iran can prove to the world that it too can produce powerful military equipment.
It also gives Iran a chance to field test these new weapons and give a display of just how much its military capabilities have improved in the past few years. Iran has also dispatched advisors to the Russian-occupied areas of Ukraine, who are reportedly providing the Russian drone operators with technical instruction. While Iran's government has officially denied selling the Sahed drones to Russia, analysts say there is clear evidence that they have. U.S. and Ukrainian intelligence services have claimed that Russia ordered around 600 of the drones at the beginning of the summer, about 250 of which have been so far deployed. Their presence in Russia is also backed up by other statements from the Iranian military. A major general in Iran recently said that major world powers are using Iranian-made arms. While its cyber warfare chief posted on Twitter that this head drone was now the most talked about weapon in the world. This trend reverses the usual pattern of large countries selling weapons to smaller ones and means that Russia now has a reliable source of new weapons to continue the conflict. But by using Iranian-made drones, Russia now risks drawing in more international actors who support Ukraine. The most important of these might be Iran's political nemesis, Israel, which has so far remained neutral in the Ukraine war due to its complex relations with Russia. But on October 16th, Israeli cabinet minister Nachman Sa'i tweeted that Sahed drones removed any doubt where Israel should stand, urging military and economic support for Ukraine. Iran's growing alliance with Russia also makes a new nuclear deal between Iran and the West unlikely, an outcome favorable to Israel, which opposed the original agreement in 2015. But what does all this mean for Ukraine? Even though Ukrainian troops have continued to retake territory to the east, because of this new steady supply of modern military equipment, the conflict is unlikely to end anytime soon. With the Sahed drones and other Iranian weapons, Russia can continue its mass destruction of power stations, ammunition depots, and even civilian targets like apartment buildings. Western sanctions have little to no impact on the flow of weapons from Iran to Russia, making the alliance strategically valuable to both countries. But things are about to get even messier. A recent report by the Washington Post found that Iran will also begin selling their short-range ballistic missiles to Russia, which are deadlier than the Sahed drones. These developments pose a serious threat to Ukraine, which has also stepped up its calls for more Western support in the form of weapons and humanitarian aid. As the conflict becomes ever more international, there is a constant risk of escalation, especially as countries with previous rivalries like Iran and Israel get involved. Russia receiving a steady supply of these drones also means that nowhere in Ukraine is safe anymore. While ground fighting is still contained in the east of the country, Russia can use its new stockpile of Iranian weapons to attack cities and villages in the west of Ukraine. So even though the war has turned into an embarrassing failure, Russia may continue to rain death and destruction from above. There's no doubt that the use of the Sahed 136 drones marks a new and potentially terrifying phase of the war in Ukraine. Their precision targeting, unpredictability, long range, and cheap cost make them an ideal weapon for Russia's faltering military. Not to mention that the growing alliance between Russia and Iran might also mark a new stage of the war, one where even more international forces are pulled into the fray. December 7, 1941, 7.54 a.m., one minute before the attack on Pearl Harbor. Petty Officer First Class Joseph Leon George is aboard the USS Vestal. He's staring at the hull of the USS Arizona. George is part of the repair crew who's checking the battleship to ensure it's ready to deploy with the rest of the Pacific Sea Fleet. He's talking to the other sailors aboard the Vestal about upcoming repairs when they hear the buzzing of plane engines. What's that? One of the sailors asks. Suddenly, a whistling sound from above starts to grow louder and louder. Take cover! George yells. At that very moment, a Japanese bomb strikes the Arizona and detonates. Fire erupts on the ship's decks. Debris flies everywhere. George's ears ring. He stands up and squints hard to focus his sight. He sways from side to side, trying to get his balance. George looks next to him and sees a member of his crewmates trying to stand. He reaches down and helps the sailor up. Are you okay? George screams, but he can barely hear his own voice. A moment later, another bomb detonates atop the deck of the USS Arizona. It's the Japanese, someone yells. Get to the guns! George is about to run to the armory when he sees six men trapped in the control tower aboard the Arizona. Flames slowly creep up toward them from all sides. Help us! George hears one of the sailors yell. The Arizona has begun to sink. Cut the line! A commander shouts to George. The Vestal is still moored to the sinking battleship. George looks at the rope and then at the men trapped in the control tower. As the Arizona continues to be struck by bombs, the tower is slowly listing toward the deck of the Vestal. I said cut the line, sailor! The commander yells again. George looks at the knife in his hand for a moment, then sheaths it. He runs to the side of the ship, and instead of cutting the line, he grabs more rope that's lying on the deck. The sailors aboard the Arizona are screaming as the flames engulf the command tower. George doesn't think, he just acts. He waits for the right moment and throws the rope toward the men. One of them catches it, 
George shouts at the sailors to secure their end and climb across to the vessel. He prays they can make it aboard before the flames consume them, and they're lost like the thousands of other soldiers who will perish at Pearl Harbor. July 1940, one year and five months before the attack on Pearl Harbor. We cannot allow Japan to continue their expansion in the Pacific. They continue to wage their brutal war in China and have now expanded into Cambodia, Laos, and Vietnam, a high-ranking general says to the gathered U.S. leadership. Their brutal war in China has emboldened them. The country is modernized at an astonishing rate, and their navy has become a formidable force. We must act now. President Franklin Delano Roosevelt nods his head. The conflict in Europe is not going well. Seems that authoritarian rule will be the way of the future if the U.S. doesn't aid the Allies in Europe and stop Japanese imperialism in the Pacific. But the nation as a whole has decided to stay out of the war after the horrors that were experienced in the Great War. Very well, the president says. Impose trade sanctions and implement an oil embargo on Japan. We need to slow their economic growth to disrupt their military expansion. The president pushes his wheelchair back from the table. His advisors rise from their seats, and the commander-in-chief exits the room. Early January 1941, 11 months before the attack on Pearl Harbor, Admiral Itsuroku Yamamoto meets with other Japanese officials about how to deal with the United States and the sanctions it's placed on Japan. These sanctions have in effect crippled the Japanese empire, cutting it off from badly needed industrial products. If they do nothing, the empire of the rising sun will wither and die on the vine. There's only one choice, and he knows it. He's not sure that a war with the U.S. is wise, but something needs to be done. Yamamoto has quickly risen through the ranks for his strategic prowess and dedication to the imperial cause. I'm not sure if we can defeat the American Pacific Sea Fleet, especially with their bases in the Philippines and throughout the Pacific waters, Yamamoto warns. Discontented grumbles rise from the other military officers at the meeting. Japanese nationalism is in full swing. Their progress through the Pacific and East Asia has strengthened their fortitude. Many dream of a Japanese empire. It's not optimal. Prime Minister Tojo Hideki hisses. We will defeat the Americans, so figure out how to make it possible. Yamamoto sighs and places his hand on a manila folder in front of him. There may be a way, Yamamoto says. There's a U.S. naval base in Hawaii. They keep most of the Pacific Sea Fleet there. It could be our only shot. Prime Minister Hideki's eyes seem to reflect the fires of burning warships. As he reads the proposal, his lips curl into a shark-like smile. January 27, 1941 less than 11 months before the attack on Pearl Harbor. Joseph Grew dashes through a Tokyo alleyway. He hides behind a pile of garbage and pants heavily. He stumbled onto something that the Japanese would kill to keep quiet. He glances around the corner to make sure he isn't being followed. Grew sprints toward a building across the street. It's where he's been staying throughout his negotiations with the Japanese government. They're upset about the sanctions and the embargoes, but Gru's been trying to find a diplomatic way to maintain peace while also moderating Japanese ambitions. Now he fears for his life, as the information he's uncovered will almost certainly lead to war. He bursts through the front doors of the building that acts as the United States intelligence base of operations. I need to send a wire to the president, he screams at the staff, who are monitoring different communications in the area. Everyone stares at him in shock. The ambassador's shirt is untucked, his face covered in dirt. If they didn't know any better, the staff would have thought this was just some crazy man who wandered in off the street. But they quickly recognize the ambassador and escort him to the back of the room. There he writes a message that will be wired back to the United States. When it's finished, he looks at the other Americans in the room. Pack your stuff, he says. When the president gets this wire, we'll need to be ready to leave Japan at a moment's notice. An intelligence officer runs through the halls of the White House. The president is meeting with the senior military staff about the escalating tensions in the Pacific. The officer enters the room. Everyone turns to look at him. In his hand, he clutches a piece of paper. He just received a communication from the ambassador to Japan. The intelligence officer cautiously walks up to the president. This just came over the wire for you, sir. You need to read it immediately. The president takes the message and scans it. The communication is from Joseph Grew, Roosevelt says out loud. He's just discovered plans that Japan will launch a surprise attack on Pearl Harbor. There's silence in the room. The chief of naval operations speaks first. That can't possibly be true. There's no way the Japanese would attack at the Pacific Fleet without first declaring war, and there's no indication they're prepared to do so. The rest of the military leaders in the room agree. It's far more likely the Japanese will attack Manila in the Philippines if they ever dare to start a war with us, the naval officer concludes. The president reads the message one more time. He crumples it up and gives it back to the intelligence officer. It's agreed then, Roosevelt responds. An attack on Pearl Harbor is not plausible. We'll operate under the assumption that if Japan does become aggressive, we need to mount a defense in the Philippines. The intelligence officer is dismissed. The meeting between his military leaders and the president continues. There's no warning sent to Pearl Harbor or any other military installation in Hawaii about the communication that Ambassador Joseph Grew sent. February 1941, 10 months before the attack on Pearl Harbor. I'm happy to announce the new admiral of the Pacific Fleet, Husband E. Kimmel. 
The roar of applause fills the warm Hawaiian air. There's a lot to do now that Admiral Kimmel is in command. A celebratory dinner was planned in his honor, but first he must talk to Lieutenant General Walter C. Short about the defense of the islands. Using the intel that's been sent to them, they devise a plan to protect the islands from any threat. Both Kimmel and Short are not privy to the communication sent by Ambassador Gru, so they do not know the true extent of a Japanese threat on their forces. However, both men decide, without having all the information, that the island's defenses are lacking and ask Washington for additional men and equipment. Washington says they'll consider it. For now, Kimmel and Short must do their best with what they have. May 1941, seven months before the attack on Pearl Harbor. Admiral Kichisoburo Nomura of the Imperial Japanese Navy explains the situation. They've broken our codes, he shouts. The Americans know everything we've been planning. The rest of the Japanese leadership, except for a select few, disregard Nomura's warning. There's no way the US could have broken their codes. And if they had, surely there would have been some sort of repercussion for the planning of a secret attack at one of their naval installations. Nomura pleads with the Japanese leadership to change their plans, or at the very least, to use new codes. His requests all fall on deaf ears. An SIS intelligence officer waits until the room is clear. He sneaks into the Japanese office and quickly takes pictures of the documents lying on the desk. The pictures are brought back to the analysts working for the United States Army's Signals Intelligence Service and the Navy's Communications Special Unit, both of which are part of the MAGIC program to decrypt Japanese communications. These coded documents, along with the intercepted encrypted Morse code messages sent between diplomats and the Japanese military, begin to paint a clearer picture of what they have planned in the Pacific. All intercepted communications are sent back to Washington. However, much of the intel is never forwarded to Kimmel and Short in Hawaii. July 1941, five months before the attack on Pearl Harbor. Admiral Yamamoto stares through the lenses of his binoculars, watching his fleet carry out a series of maneuvers. For now, he and the highest-ranking military officers are the only ones who know about what they're training for. Every day, relations between Japan and the United States become more and more tense. Every day, Yamamoto advocates for another solution besides war. But the leadership of Japan and the Prime Minister Tojo Hideki in particular doesn't want to hear words of doubt. They will declare war on the United States with or without Yamamoto's help. Admiral Yamamoto gives in and advises that the only hope Japan has is to attack the naval base at Pearl Harbor and crush the U.S. Pacific Fleet before they can be sent further west. Now every day is a new naval exercise. Sailors are drilled and pushed to their limit. The ships sail through rough waters to ready their crews for the journey to come. Pilots regularly practice their maneuvers after launching from the decks of carriers. This will be the largest and most important modern assault in Japanese naval history. Yamamoto just prays that it is enough to cripple the U.S. fleet, otherwise all will be lost. September 24, 1941, less than three months before the attack on Pearl Harbor. Sir, we have to let Kimmel and Short know about this, the intelligence officer says. They just intercepted a coded transmission from Japanese naval intelligence to Japan's Consul General in Honolulu asking for a grid of the exact locations of ships in Pearl Harbor. The message is called the Bomb Plot, and it's a clear indication that the Japanese have an interest in the U.S. forces stationed there. The culmination of all the deciphered messages and communications clearly reveals that the Japanese are planning something. Yet, Washington seems to have its own agenda. We will consider what this means for our forces in the Pacific, the general says, taking the Bomb Plot message from the intelligence officer. Thank you for your hard work. You can return to your post. But sir! The intelligence officer tries to protest. I said you are dismissed. The conversation is over. The bomb plot message is filed away and is never sent to Admiral Kimmel or General Short. November 16, 1941, 21 days before the attack on Pearl Harbor. Sirens wail throughout the Japanese I-400 class submarine as it prepares to dive. Sailors make final preparations before the sub descends into the dark depths of the Pacific. On board, they carry Type A midget submarines, which will be launched into the waters of Pearl Harbor on the day of the attack. November 26, 1941, 11 days before the attack on Pearl Harbor. Vice Admiral Chuichi Nagumo stands aboard the bridge of the attack fleet's flagship. He's received the command for all vessels to begin their journey to Hawaii. The fleet consists of over 60 ships, six of which are aircraft carriers, and more than a dozen warships. The rest of the vessels are for support, but it's more than enough to annihilate the U.S. forces stationed at Pearl Harbor. November 27, 1941, 10 days before the attack on Pearl Harbor. Did you see the communication from Washington? Admiral Kimmel asks General Short. Yeah, it said there could be a possible Japanese attack on American targets in the Pacific. It didn't seem too concerned about us, though, Short replies. The Admiral nods his head. We should still keep a close eye on things, Kimmel notes. They filed the communication away and continue to conduct routine defensive measures. The request for more men and equipment still hasn't been approved. Seems as if the government sees no serious threat to the ships and men stationed at Pearl Harbor. 
November 28, 1941, nine days before the attack on Pearl Harbor. A horn blast cuts through the salty Hawaiian air. Military personnel wave to Task Force 8 as it leaves Pearl Harbor for Wake Island in the middle of the Pacific. There's a U.S. military base there, but the mission itself is classified. The USS Enterprise, one of the three aircraft carriers in the Pacific Fleet, and 12 other ships leave the blue waters of Pearl Harbor and embark on their journey. December 5, 1941, two days before the attack on Pearl Harbor. Rear Admiral John H. Newton salutes from the deck of the USS Lexington as the aircraft carrier leaves Pearl Harbor to deliver 18 Vought SB-2U-3 Vindicators of the Marine Scout Bombing Squadron 231 to Midway Island. At that same time, the USS Saratoga, which was also normally stationed at Pearl Harbor, has just completed repairs and modifications at the Puget Sound Navy Yard in Bremerton, Washington. It's sailing to Naval Air Station North Island near San Diego before it's scheduled to return to Pearl Harbor and regroup with the rest of the Pacific Fleet. At this point in time, none of the aircraft carriers are docked at Pearl Harbor, but there is no way for Admiral Isoroku Yamamoto to know this as his attack force gets closer and closer to the Hawaiian Islands. December 6, 1941, late in the evening, less than 12 hours before the attack on Pearl Harbor. U.S. intelligence is buzzing. A newly deciphered message indicates there is a deadline for Japanese action scheduled for the following morning. It's not clear from the message exactly what the action will be, but it can't be good. The President of the United States and his advisors don't believe Japan will launch an attack until a declaration of war has been announced. Analysts scramble to try to uncover more information. Half a world away, Ambassador Joseph Grew sits in his office. There is shouting outside his door and the sound of something hitting the ground. He stares at the entryway as several shadows materialize on the other side of the frosted glass door window. The door is forced open, and several Japanese soldiers swarm the office. They take Gru captive in preparation for what is to come. December 7, 1941, 3.42 a.m., four hours before the attack on Pearl Harbor. A sailor aboard the USS Condor spots something in the water. Sir, I think you should take a look at this. The captain walks over to his station. What is that? The captain asks. He looks around the bridge. All eyes are on him. The captain of the Condor runs the side of the ship. Get me binoculars, he shouts. The captain stares through the lenses. The moon illuminates the entrance to Pearl Harbor. Something is cutting through the water. It looks like a periscope. He can't be sure it was a submarine that was spotted, so the minesweeper is ordered to continue its patrol to get a better handle on the situation. December 7, 1941, 6.10 a.m., one hour and 45 minutes before the attack on Pearl Harbor. The men stationed at Pearl Harbor begin to awake and start their morning routines. The horizon becomes red as the sun prepares to rise. It's peaceful and serene. Sailors play tennis before their duties begin. Others are already at the mess hall to have breakfast. A soldier steps out of the barracks and looks at the sunrise. He stretches out and says the old adage, not knowing how true it'll be this day, red sky at night, sailors delight, red sky in the morning, sailors take warning. There's no indication in the coming hours the island will be swarmed by Japanese aircraft and the waters will run crimson with blood. 275 miles north of the island of Oahu, the Japanese fleet has come to a stop. The sailors prepare for the attack. Planes are checked and rechecked. The position of every ship is precisely coordinated. The engines of the aircraft roar to life. Vice Admiral Nagumo gives the order to launch. Planes scream across the decks of the six aircraft carriers and take flight. They get into formation and begin heading toward Pearl Harbor. December 7, 1941, 6.45 a.m., 75 minutes before the attack on Pearl Harbor. Cannons fire and depth charges drop from the USS Ward. The Condor had been right, there was a Japanese sub in Pearl Harbor's waters. The crew of the Ward maneuvers the ship to get a better shot. The cannon fire can be heard from the shores. Some stop what they're doing to see what the commotion is, others just chalk it up to a training exercise. The Ward stops firing to confirm if they've sunk the Japanese sub. December 7, 1941, 6.53 a.m., 62 minutes before the attack on Pearl Harbor. The captain of the ward radios the headquarters of the 14th Naval District, which is responsible for defending the Hawaiian Islands. We've attacked, fired upon, and dropped depth charges upon a submarine operating in the defensive perimeter, the captain says. The district commandant makes an assumption that will have drastic consequences. He assumes the Japanese submarine is an isolated incident. The USS Ward is more than capable of dispatching a single sub. The Commandant takes no further action. The commander of the Pacific Fleet is notified of the incident, but waits for confirmation that the sub has been destroyed before taking any further actions. December 7, 1941, 7.02 a.m., 53 minutes before the attack on Pearl Harbor. A soldier manning a radar station on Oahu squints at his screen. What the hell is that? He asks himself. A large formation of aircraft has appeared off the coast of the island. He informs his superior who looks at the radar readings. He walks over to the manifest hanging on the wall. 
the lieutenant flips through the pages, walks back to the radar station and looks at the readings again. Must be the B-17 bomber scheduled to arrive today, he says to the technician. Must have just gotten here early. He alerts no one of what has been picked up on the radar. December 7, 1941, 7.40 a.m., 15 minutes before the attack on Pearl Harbor. The sound of plane engines breaks the peaceful serenity on Oahu. Soldiers on the north side of the island look up at the sky. They can't believe what they see. 183 Japanese aircraft fly overhead. They're armed with bombs, torpedoes, and heavy machine guns. December 7, 1941, 7.49 a.m., six minutes before the attack on Pearl Harbor. A group of Japanese planes detaches from the main attack force. They head inland toward Wheeler Field. Aircraft sit on the tarmac awaiting inspection. This is the largest airfield on the island. Gino Gasparelli walks toward the mess hall, looking at the fighter planes as he passes. He moves at a much more leisurely pace than he has for the last several days. The airfield has been on high alert for almost a week, but yesterday the alert had been called off. The 48 planes Gino passes are lined up in a row, wingtip to wingtip on the tarmac in front of their hangars. He strides toward the barracks to get changed and enjoy some R&R off base. Gino enters the barracks and begins a conversation with some of the men who are getting ready for the day. They laugh as they talk about their plans. The lightheartedness of the discussion is shattered when the drone of engines is heard outside the barracks. Gino looks around. There are no scheduled exercises today, he says to the other soldiers. Their eyes open wide as the sound of plane engines gets louder and louder. Move! Gino shouts. The men burst out the back door of the barracks. Gino looks up into the sky and sees several black planes flying just above the treetops. He makes eye contact with the gunner sitting in the back seat of one of the planes. Gino watches in horror as a bomb is released from the aircraft and begins to fall. He dashes back into the barracks and shouts at everyone who's still asleep or just waking up from the previous night of partying to get out now. There is no time to get dressed, grab belongings, or hesitate. The men run out of the barracks and head for cover. Gino glances at the airfield as the bomb dropped from the Japanese plane explodes, taking out one of the hangars. The platoon sergeant shouts at the men to take cover in the tree line. Gino sprints toward the trees as bullets pepper the ground all around him. The gunners are firing down at the retreating soldiers. Gino dives into the shrubs and bushes along the tree line. The rest of the squad is still making their way toward cover. They have no weapons to return fire with as twigs and branches are shattered by machine gun fire above their heads. The planes continue to circle for several minutes, dropping bombs on the airfield and firing at anything that moves. The platoon leader orders Gino and the rest of the squad who made it to the tree line to sneak into the armory and grab the 20 caliber rifles. Others grab cement bags and create a makeshift bunker. Gino darts in between buildings. He dives under vehicles to stay out of sight of the Japanese gunners. Soldiers who have secured rifles fire up into the air to no avail. Gino grabs a cement bag and orders his squad mates to do the same. They carry the bags back to the platoon as quickly as possible. The Japanese aircraft continue south to join the rest of the attack force at Pearl Harbor. Gino looks across Wheeler Airfield and counts no fewer than 80 dead or wounded soldiers. December 7, 1941, 7.55 a.m. The attack on Pearl Harbor begins. Japanese aircraft appear in the sky over Pearl Harbor. They look like a swarm of locusts coming to destroy the island. The attack force is made up of Mitsubishi A6 M2 Zeros. They are fast and agile, allowing them to maneuver into striking positions and hit their targets hard. The military personnel at Pearl Harbor watch as Japanese aircraft blot out the sun and drop their payloads on ships there. Everyone who witnesses the onslaught of enemy planes approaching tries desperately to mount a defense. They have been given no warning. Unfortunately, there are thousands of soldiers who have no idea the attack has even begun. They're in the bellies of the ships, where there's no view of the outside world. Others are fast asleep after finishing their night shifts. The tragedy that is unfolding in real time is like nothing any of these men have ever experienced. As the first wave of the attack begins on Pearl Harbor, five ships are hit with bombs. One of these vessels is the USS Arizona. Joseph Leon George had watched as the Arizona erupted in flames and six men became trapped in the ship's control tower. Now he's desperately trying to save their lives. December 7, 1941, 8 a.m., five minutes after the attack on Pearl Harbor began. The line that George threw to the men aboard the Arizona goes taut. They've secured their end. George shouts at them to climb across as he holds the other end of the rope to make sure it doesn't slip. One by one, the men in the control tower of the Arizona shimmy along the rope to the safety of the Vestal. George and several other sailors help the men from the USS Arizona on board. The last man in the command tower grabs onto the rope and starts climbing. The flames have fully enveloped the command center. George prays the flames don't snap the rope before the sailor makes it across. It's a long way to the water surface below, and the impact would probably knock the sailor out. George urges him forward. The rope begins to fray. The fire licks at the fibers, causing them to snap one by one. Hurry! George shouts. 
The sailor grits his teeth and climbs as fast as he can. He's not going to make it, George thinks. He reaches out his hand, grabs onto the sailor, and pulls him aboard the Vestal. A moment later, the rope snaps. Joseph George saved all six lives of the men trapped aboard the USS Arizona Command Tower. The battleship burns for another two and a half days in the water of Pearl Harbor. December 7, 1941, 8.10 a.m., 15 minutes after the attack on Pearl Harbor began, Sterling Kale scans the harbor as the USS Arizona explodes into a fireball of shrapnel and thick black smoke. He'd just finished a long night of work as a pharmacist's mate, where he dispensed medicine. When he first saw the planes emerge in the skies over Battleship Row, he thought it was odd there was so much action on a Sunday. But once the bombs started falling, he realized this wasn't an exercise. Pearl Harbor was under attack. Kale runs toward the explosions in the harbor. He looks up just as a plane rips across the sky above him. He can see the red circles on the craft's fuselage and immediately understands that the Japanese have declared war on the United States. He stops his forward momentum and veers toward one of the armories to grab a rifle. While at the armory, Kale runs into some other soldiers from the base. They band together and run toward Battleship Row, where bombs detonate everywhere. They run toward the severely damaged USS Oklahoma. Smoke bellows from its hull and the sounds of screams cut through the air, even as explosions continue throughout the harbor. Come on, Kale shouts. We need to get to the Oklahoma. Save everyone we can. As they get closer, there's a gut-wrenching groaning sound. The battleship begins to list and then rolls to its side. Kale and the other men come to a stop as they watch the top of the Oklahoma disappear from view. They still need our help, Kale yells. He continues running toward the water where the men are swimming for their lives. As he approaches the docks, Kale can feel the intense heat. But it's not just the ships that are ablaze, the water itself is on fire. The oil leaking from the ships has coated the water's surface and ignited. Now sailors desperately trying to escape the carnage are simultaneously being burnt to death while drowning. It's an image that will fuel nightmares for many years to come. Kale and the other men dive into the water. They swim under the flames to reach wounded sailors. It's dangerous, but it's their only hope. One by one, Kale and the others pull half-conscious men out of the burning waters. He sees the USS Arizona and other ships get hit again and again by Japanese bombs. Kale's in the water long after the Japanese aircraft return to their carriers. He manages to pull 45 sailors out of the water over the course of four hours. Some are already dead. Others are just exhausted and need a helping hand. When his body can no longer tread through the water from fatigue, Kale returns to the medical facilities and begins helping with triage. There will be no rest for several days as the aftermath of Pearl Harbor sets in, and he tries to help save as many lives as possible. December 7, 1941, 8.17 a.m., 22 minutes after the attack on Pearl Harbor began. Fire! screams the captain of the USS Helm. Japanese Type A midget submarines have entered the harbor and are firing torpedoes at American ships. There are at least five of the subs in the harbor, but now there's one less. The Helm's cannons hit one of the enemy vessels at the entrance to the harbor. It explodes and bubbles as the sub sinks to the bottom of the harbor. December 7, 1941, 8.54 a.m., the second wave begins. 170 Japanese aircraft circle around the east side of Oahu. The initial attack on Pearl Harbor has been raging for an hour. This second wave will bring even more death and destruction. Everest Capra is stationed at Hickman Field near the entrance to the harbor. When the initial attack started, Capra could see the Japanese planes in the distance. He noticed the circles on the wings and shouted, They're here! They're here! The entire base jumped into action. Capra and the other men at Hickman had just enough time to gear up before the first wave hit. Now the fight for their lives continues as the second wave of Japanese planes fly overhead. Capra dodges machine gun fire and explosions as he runs toward a wounded soldier. He slides across the ground to the man's side. Are you alright? He asks, but it's clear that the soldier has lost consciousness. Capra picks him up and slings the man across his shoulders. He carries the wounded man to the newly built hospital at the airfield and drops him off. He then immediately turns around and runs out the door to help rescue other fallen soldiers. Capra spots a man crawling for cover. He races toward the wounded soldier. At that moment, a bomb falls from the sky. It detonates next to Capra, sending him flying through the air. He hits the ground hard and blacks out. When he finally comes to, it's clear that at least some time has passed. There are still Japanese planes in the sky, but fewer than before. Capra rubs his head and feels warm liquid running down his cheek. He looks at his hands and sees that his index finger is hanging by a thread. Capra tries to stand up but falls back to the ground. He's bleeding badly from his leg. He crawls to a nearby barrack and finds masking tape. He tapes his finger back to his hand and wraps the adhesive around the wound in his leg. His biggest fear is that if he went to the hospital, they'd put him in a bed and he wouldn't be able to help his comrades. With his finger secured and the bleeding under control, Capra runs back onto the airfield looking for more wounded soldiers to help. December 7, 1941, 9.30 a.m., 
one hour and 35 minutes after the initial attack on Pearl Harbor began. The USS Shaw explodes in dry dock. Every single battleship at Pearl Harbor has been hit, but only the USS Arizona and Oklahoma are completely destroyed. Vice Admiral Nagumo is informed that the first two waves failed to destroy many of the ships docked at Pearl Harbor. It's requested that a third strike be launched. It's too risky, Nagumo says. I'm in charge of this attacking force. We caused immense damage with minimal casualties. It's time to return home. His officers agree. The fleet prepares to sail back to Japan. Out of the 353 aircraft involved in the attack on Pearl Harbor, only 29 were lost. The remaining aircraft are recalled to their carriers. 30 minutes later, the last of the Japanese planes leaves the island of Oahu. The Japanese believe their surprise attack was a resounding success, and they have effectively crippled the Pacific Fleet, their celebration as they make their way back to Japan. It's believed that the attack on Pearl Harbor will keep the United States from taking an offensive position in the Pacific. This will allow them to expand further along the coast of East Asia and in the Pacific Theater. However, they've made a huge miscalculation. The fact that all three U.S. aircraft carriers were not at Pearl Harbor during the attack means that these ships are fully functional and ready to be deployed across the Pacific. United States oil supplies, submarines, and repair facilities around the Hawaiian Islands and at other positions in the Pacific were left untouched. Logistically, the U.S. Navy is in good shape. Even though two battleships were destroyed, the rest of the battleships in the Pacific Fleet are able to be repaired. This takes time, but it's a huge mistake by Japan not to make sure that the battleships were more severely damaged. December 8, 1941, one day after the attack on Pearl Harbor. President Franklin Delano Roosevelt stands before Congress and speaks the first sentence in one of the most famous speeches in history. Yesterday, December 7, 1941, a date which will live in infamy, the United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked by the naval and air forces of the Empire of Japan. Until this point, the American public did not want the nation to enter the war, but that all changed after that attack on Pearl Harbor. The Japanese attack may have temporarily damaged the Pacific Fleet, but it also enraged the country and now the United States is coming for revenge. December 16, 1941, nine days after the attack on Pearl Harbor, Admiral Kimmel and General Short are relieved of their commands. The United States government needs a scapegoat for the 2,403 Americans that died at Pearl Harbor. Even though these two men were never given all the information and intel they needed to prepare for the attack, the government still blames them for what happened. The next year, the Roberts Commission, appointed by President Roosevelt, finds Kimmel and Short in dereliction of duty. The commission claims that these two men are solely responsible for the Pearl Harbor disaster. This decision is a gross misrepresentation of what actually transpired between the months before the attack and the attack itself. January 1944, two years and one month after the attack on Pearl Harbor, a man by the name of Captain Lawrence Safford discovers damning evidence against the U.S. government and shows they had prior knowledge of a possible attack on Pearl Harbor before it happened. Stafford was the Navy's former chief cryptographer. While going through old documents, he stumbles across evidence that Washington withheld secret information from Kimmel and Short. In light of this new evidence, 11 months later, a naval court of inquiry finds that Kimmel was in fact not derelict in his duties, but had acted appropriately with the information he had. Not wanting to be blamed by the public for the death and destruction of Pearl Harbor, the chief of naval operations overrules the court's findings to protect the government. It's decided that if Kimmel had conducted aerial reconnaissance, he might have discovered the Japanese fleet off the coast of Hawaii. This is a thinly veiled attempt to protect the government and place the blame on a single individual. May 25, 1999, 57 years and 7 months after the attack on Pearl Harbor, a resolution is presented to the Senate. 52 senators vote in favor, 47 against. A non-binding resolution to exonerate both Kimmel and Short as the sole two individuals responsible for the disaster at Pearl Harbor is passed. The Senate requests that the President of the United States posthumously restore both of them to full rank. Then-President Bill Clinton did not act on the resolution. George W. Bush did not act on the resolution. Barack Obama did not act on the resolution. Donald Trump did not act on the resolution. Joe Biden has yet to act on the resolution. Both husband E. Kimmel and Walter Campbell Short are still officially the only two men responsible for letting the attack on Pearl Harbor occur on December 7, 1941. The moon shines down on a stretch of beach along a remote Japanese island. The waters here run deep just a few feet from the beach, which makes it a perfect training ground for the pilots who will soon be in charge of Japan's latest devastating weapon, the Kamikaze Torpedo. By mid-1944, the war in the Pacific was turning for Japan. Humiliating and disastrous defeats across the South Pacific had seen the Japanese fleet utterly decimated. While it still had numerous surface navy, almost all of its carriers had either been destroyed or sunk. 
The news underwater wasn't much better. Japanese subs were being overwhelmed by mass-produced American destroyers. Every time one was sunk, it seemed like two sprung up in its place weeks later. Now the remaining submarine fleet was ordered to stay close to the relative safety of the innermost Japanese shipping lanes, which were themselves being decimated by American subs. The Japanese Navy, which had briefly ruled the Pacific after the devastating surprise attack of Pearl Harbor, was increasingly becoming an endangered species. The Japanese doctrine of decisive battle had failed them to date, and only now, with its fleets on the ropes, the Navy is realizing this fact. For years, the IJN has sought to decimate the US Navy in one final decisive engagement, reminiscent of past naval battles of the 19th century. However, this is antiquated doctrine by World War II, and the US has brought itself time to rearm and re-equip itself by engaging in a running battle with the IJN, striking quickly and decisively before disengaging. By the start of 1944, the US is no longer disengaging. It is holding its ground and fighting, and without her carrier fleet, the Japanese Navy can no longer win a decisive battle. Desperate times call for desperate measures. A weapon that can reliably sink American ships is desperately needed. But war materials are running short due to incessant attacks on shipping by American subs, and some supply lines are no longer viable due to Allied blockades. Necessity, though, is the mother of invention, and two Japanese naval engineers come up with a desperate but decidedly powerful weapon. The standard torpedo of the age is unguided and instead are pre-programmed to run at a set depth and course. Initially, torpedoes would skim the surface or run just a few feet below it, striking an enemy vessel dead on. However, with ever-improving armor for big battleships and cruisers, it was feared the torpedoes would no longer be viable options on these targets. Thus, torpedoes were designed to run under the hull of the ship. Once approaching the underside of the hull, the torpedo's magnetic exploder would detonate, setting off the primary explosive payload. The massive force of the explosion would strike the ship where it was weakest, at her keel. Structural damage would thus doom the ship, or at least heavily damage it and render it mission ineffective. To improve accuracy against moving targets and to allow submarines to fire at targets without needing to fully face them head-on, torpedoes were developed that could be pre-programmed with a target's course, distance, and speed. Then the torpedo could be fired and the weapon would execute a wide swing toward the estimated intersection point, exploding upon arrival if a ship was there or simply continuing on until it ran out of fuel and sank to the depths. While improvements had been made, torpedoes were still wildly inaccurate, and a better solution had to be found to make the most of Japan's dwindling war materials. Today, with the moon shining down on a formation of 12 young Japanese men, that solution has been found. The assembled men's ages vary from 18 to the early 20s. Some are even younger, having falsified their ages in order to enlist. These are the last of Japan's available military manpower. Most of its veterans have either been wounded too severely to continue serving or lost in battle. Those that survive are far too valuable for this secret mission, but the young men are mostly fresh recruits. Young, willing, dedicated body and mind to the Emperor, and completely expendable. The Emperor protects. On command, the first young man rushes to the breaking surf where a strange craft awaits him. It resembles a torpedo with a length of about 30 feet but has a bubble canopy and a canvas seat inside of it. The makeshift cockpit has very rudimentary controls and no seatbelts or any other form of basic safety equipment there's no need for it. The young man jumps into the cockpit and closes the canopy, sealing himself inside. The rest of the men help push the manned torpedo into the water, and soon the torpedo has pulled free of the sand. The pilot activates the torpedo's battery-powered propeller, and the entire contraption lurches forward and out to the sea. This is just a training exercise, and each man will take his place inside one of the several training torpedoes. Their goal is to maneuver the torpedo to make a run underneath a small practice vessel, sitting at anchor several hundred feet from the shore. Today, the torpedoes contain no explosive charge, but they soon will. The torpedo slips beneath the waves like a small submersible running just a few feet under the water. The controls are rudimentary, though, and the torpedo can be a little difficult to steer properly for the inexperienced pilot. That's fine, in combat the pilot will need to only make small adjustments. Even a novice skill level is suitable for what will be the first and last mission of each pilot's life. Eventually, the young man steers the torpedo true. As he nears the practice vessel, he presses down a foot pedal meant to force the torpedo to submerge. The torpedo, however, does not respond. These machines have been quickly assembled, and engineering is rough, as is expected of a weapon meant to be used only once. As the torpedo nears the simulated enemy vessel, the pilot desperately kicks down on his pedal, but the torpedo does not respond. A second later, there's a sickening crunch as the torpedo slams straight into the side of the ship. The entire front nose section where the explosives would be on a real weapon collapses in on itself. The pilot, with no safety restraints of any kind, is hurled forward and into the controls with the violence of a 45-mile-per-hour wreck. His face is fractured in multiple places and his neck broken on impact. 
The shattered canopy quickly fills with water, and men aboard the ship frantically begin rescue efforts only to be stopped by their captain. There is no point. The young man has given his life to the glory of the Emperor. Back on the beach, the instructors give a solemn nod before barking out a command, ordering the next fresh recruit into one of the remaining training torpedoes. Life in Imperial Japan is cheap and easily expended for the Emperor. Those that survive today's training will soon find themselves earning that glory for themselves. Several weeks later, four of the recruits find themselves aboard a Japanese submarine. Two other submarines make for a small wolf pack, and the Japanese are stocking a convoy of American ships. Overhead, a Japanese recon plane has spotted the convoy and maintains visual contact while staying out of range of the escort destroyer's guns, relaying course data to the submarines below the waves. One of the subs speeds forward to drop a dummy mine in the path of the convoy. The lead ship shortly after spots the mine and the entire convoy changes its course to avoid it, with the USS Underhill moving into position to sink it. After strafing it with its 20mm guns and rifle fire, the Americans realize the mine is a dummy and a diversion. Immediately, the men of the Underhill begin hunting for enemy subs. Prior to the mine being deployed, the sonar operator had made a sonar contact signaling an enemy sub, but in efforts to neutralize the mine, the contact had been lost. Now contact has been re-established and the Underhill moves straight toward what turns out to be a surface Japanese submarine. The destroyer's engines are given full power as the ship moves to ram the submarine, a common tactic that causes little damage to a destroyer but will split a submarine in half. The Japanese submarine submerges at the last moment, but the captain of the Underhill gives the order to drop depth charges. After dropping 13 charges, oil and debris float to the surface. The Japanese sub has been neutralized. A second sub, however, has moved to avenge the lost boat. Aboard the surviving Japanese submarine, an order is given, and the two young men who had been training on a sunny beach together just a few weeks ago spring into action. They crawl down a long metal tube which connects to the kamikaze torpedo named Kaiten. The torpedo is bolted onto the deck of the submarine, and once the pilot crawls into the cockpit, the attaching metal tube is disengaged. These combat-ready models lack the bubble canopy of some of the training models, and so each pilot sits in the dark. Small slits allow them to see someone out of the cockpit but the waters are too deep and murky to see much of anything. A periscope several feet high can be extended and will be the primary way of guiding the torpedo to its target. Suddenly, with a clang, the two torpedoes are disengaged from the submarine. The mission is on, and the objective is simple. Find and destroy the American vessel. The submarines quickly rush to the surface thanks to their buoyancy, and the electric engines kick on lurching the suicide weapons forward. The makeshift cockpit groans and creaks with the water pressure, and moisture leaks in from a dozen places. The pilots have to be careful to try and wipe away the moisture from the rudimentary instrument panels and controls, fearing a short that would make the Kaiten completely uncontrollable. Soon, the two torpedoes are at the surface, and the pilots use their periscopes to break the cover of the waves above them and take in the surrounding view. Up ahead of them is the American destroyer that sunk one of their submarines, a perfect target that seems to be completely unaware of their presence. Lining up a new course, each torpedo slips a few feet beneath the waves and turns toward the American ship, powering the engine to full speed. Aboard the Underhill, the sonar operator picks up the distinct sound of underwater propellers, too faint to be a submarine but too loud to be regular torpedoes. Confused, he relays this information to the captain who orders a change of course and a fresh round of depth charges. Deployed from the racks on either side of the hull, depth charges tumble down into the ocean, exploding at various depths below the destroyer. The charges don't need to be accurate, they only need to be close enough for the pressure wave from each explosion to collapse the hull of an enemy sub. The Kaitens are running at full speed toward the Underhill, and each pilot surfaces briefly to get a new fix on the American ship before submerging again. If they're spotted early, the ship's guns would easily blow them to pieces, so the men must run with only occasional glimpses at periscope depth to ensure they remain on course. Nearing the ship, both Kaitens submerge. The Underhill continues to record sonar contacts and the depth charge barrage intensifies. There is some confusion but little fear. The enemy submarine is now so close that it cannot bring its torpedoes to bear. A fresh barrage of depth charges sink into the ocean, followed by the dull roar of explosions. Two dozen feet below the ship, the force of the explosions propel the Kaitens upwards unexpectedly. One of the suicide torpedoes suffers fatal structural damage, and after breaking the surface begins to sink almost immediately. The second, however, breaks the surface on the opposite side of the ship, but remains largely operable. The men on the deck of the Underhill can't believe what they're seeing. Two enemy manned submersibles on either side of the ship. Both are so close that they can't bring any of the destroyer's guns to bear, so the captain makes a fateful decision. The Kaiten can outmaneuver the big ship at this range, so the Underhill must take advantage of the situation before the pilot can recover control of his suicide vessel. The destroyer turns hard to port at flank speed, intending to ram the Kaiten and sink it. The ship strikes the manned torpedo, 
The move proves to be a miscalculation. The pilot sets off the torpedo's explosives, rocking the big destroyer. The ship is broken in half by the massive explosion at its forward fire room, with the bow being detached and floating away, sticking straight up into the air. 112 of the crew have died in the two resulting explosions, and the underhill is a total loss. What remains floating of her will be sunk by friendly fire, with the surviving crew transferred to other ships. This is a victory for the IJN and for the Emperor. But it's a rather Pyrrhic victory, and the Kaiten suicide torpedo program will go largely to be ineffective, costing the Japanese more in materials and manpower than the Americans they were meant to sink. In total, the Kaiten program would kill about 187 Allied servicemen, with only two major kills to its credit, the Underhill and the USS Mississippiwa. Meanwhile, the program would cost the Japanese hundreds of lives and failed deployments, training deaths, and losses incurred by the sinking of submarines equipped with the weapons. Instead of helping level the playing field for the Japanese, the Kaiten suicide torpedo program would help ensure its total defeat. June 1944, the U.S.'s 2nd and 4th Marine Divisions and the Army's 27th Infantry Division hit the beaches of Saipan. Just over a week ago, the Allies made landfall in Europe, and Operation Overlord has been a major success. On June 15th, the D-Day of the Pacific begins, and Americans will face one of the toughest battles of their young nation's history. The beaches have been thoroughly cratered by shore bombardments, and on the horizon, 300 American landing vehicles are steadily streaming toward the beach. On other islands, the Japanese have allowed the Americans to make landfall almost unopposed, preferring to fight them at close quarters in the thick jungles where a bevy of booby traps and ambushes awaited them. Saipan is too important. If the Americans capture it, they'll have a key location from which to build air bases where they can strike at Japan and vital Japanese trade routes. Today, the Japanese meet the Americans bullet for bullet on the beaches. The Japanese defenders have been carefully preparing for this attack and have sighted several key positions for their artillery. As the American landing craft steam toward the beaches, sporadic and random artillery fire reaches out to them, causing minor damage to a few LVTs. However, as they near the beach, the fire becomes much more accurate. Once the landing ramps come crashing down on the first set of LVTs, the artillery fire is downright murderous. Flags set along the beach give precise range information to Japanese artillery and machine gunners, and the American Marines run into a wall of steel. Mines and barbed wire are waiting for the lucky few who escape the vicious rain of steel and shrapnel. Amphibious tanks are just now starting to make landfall, but to the infantry's dismay, the tanks are eviscerated by a round of highly precise artillery fire. Offshore, the ships supporting the invasion fleets try to respond with their own counterfire, but the crews are largely inexperienced in shore bombardment. Only the crew of a few older post-World One era battleships have much training in shore bombardment, and their accurate fire is much appreciated by the men dying on the beach by the dozens. Despite the horrible losses, the Marines managed to secure a beachhead six miles wide and half a mile deep. A steady stream of reinforcements swells the American beachheads, and if the Japanese are to have any hope of preventing the fall of Saipan, they must throw the invaders back to the sea. The invasion has been a surprise to the Japanese High Command, which expected an invasion elsewhere and an emergency relief force is quickly assembled. However, the Imperial Japanese Navy must sink the American Navy to have any hope of reinforcing its besieged troops. Sensing an opportunity to deal a decisive blow to the Americans, Admiral Soimu Toyota, commander-in-chief of the IJN, orders an attack on the U.S. ships around Saipan. If he wins the battle, Saipan can be saved. If he loses it, the island will fall to the Americans. For now, though, the 32,000 Japanese soldiers on Saipan have no hope of reinforcement and are facing an invasion force of over 72,000 Americans. The night of the invasion, Japanese forces muster for a massive nighttime counterattack. Most of the Japanese soldiers are battle-hardened from battles across the South Pacific and in China, while the Americans are fielding an even mix of veterans and fresh recruits. U.S. forces should be overwhelmed by the ferocity of a nighttime attack, something thousands of fresh American conscripts have never experienced experienced before. With a mighty roar, several thousand Japanese rush at the American beachheads. Artillery covers their attack at first, but U.S. planes have significantly reduced their number during the daytime counterattacks. As the two sides meet in brutal close quarters combat, the Japanese artillery goes quiet for fear of blowing up their own men. They don't give an inch. The Japanese infantry runs into the teeth of hastily assembled American defenses. The thick jungle gives plenty of cover to the rushing Japanese, seriously diminishing the effectiveness of American machine guns. None 
Nonetheless, American machine guns strafe out into the dark, now being illuminated by parachute flares, repaying the Japanese attackers for the hell the Americans endured from the enemy's machine guns earlier in the day. The Marines are exhausted from a full day of fighting, but if they fail now, the beachhead will collapse and the invasion will fail. The two sides clash together like armies of old, but the American defense is resolute. With a desperate bugle call, the Japanese call for a retreat. After several hours of fighting, the Americans are bloodied, exhausted, and have taken massive casualties. But the beaches have held. For their trouble, the Japanese have suffered crippling losses. It's now clear that the invasion cannot be stopped. Saipan will fall if the Japanese garrison is not reinforced. Four days later, the fate of the Japanese defenders is sealed. The Japanese attack group steaming towards Saipan has run straight into a U.S. submarine picket, who waits until nightfall to radio in the sighting. In the morning, the USS Albacore sneaks right into the midst of the Japanese forces and launches a spread of six torpedoes against the Taiho, the IJN's flagship, and one of its few remaining carriers. Heroically, one of the Japanese pilots just launched off the Taiho spots the torpedoes streaming toward his ship and dives his plane down on top of one, destroying it and himself. Of six torpedoes launched, only one hits, causing minor damage to the Taiho. However, the hit on the Taiho exploded several storage tanks of aviation fuel, and while the damage has been contained, dangerous fumes have begun building up inside the Taiho. At noon, the USS Kavala launches a devastating attack against the carrier Shokaku. Three torpedoes hit home, with one detonating the forward aviation fuel tanks. The Shokaku shudders from the explosion, and planes on her deck in the middle of being refueled erupt into flames. The ship shudders as fires spread out of control. Ten minutes later, the order to abandon ship is given. Suddenly, though, the bow of the carrier begins to sink, and within minutes she's slipping beneath the waves, taking 75% of her crew with her. Hours after taking what was a glancing blow, an inexperienced damage control officer aboard the Taiho decides to run the ship's venting system at full strength in order to vent out the explosive fuel fumes. Instead, the fumes spread throughout the ship, where they eventually come in contact with an electrical spark. A massive explosion rocks the ship and the carrier is quickly engulfed in flames. The Taiho joins the Shukaku at the bottom of the Pacific Ocean. The next day, American planes search the Philippine Sea for the Japanese forces. If they slip past the American carriers, they'll be able to reach the landing forces at Saipan. Despite having lost two carriers already, the Japanese fleet would easily devastate the small American force defending the landings, mostly made up of post-World War I ships. Then, at around 3.40 p.m., an American scout finds the Japanese forces. The battle group is at the very limit of the American carrier force's max range, but despite this, a two-wave attack is launched. The Japanese must not be allowed to slip past, or the landings will be doomed. And to add to the incentive, the Japanese have few carriers left. Sinking the remaining carriers will hasten an end to the war. An attack wave of 95 Hellcat fighters, 54 Avenger torpedo bombers, and 77 dive bombers roar off the flight decks of the American carriers. As the last plane takes to the sky, the second wave is already being fueled and armed. However, a new sighting report puts the Japanese forces 60 miles further than originally thought. This places them at the very maximum limits of the American planes, and with it being already so late in the day, the planes will have to land at night, an extremely dangerous proposition. The second attack wave is cancelled, better to risk only a part of the carrier's planes on the attack. Hours later, as the sun is setting over the Philippine Sea, the American pilots finally sight the Japanese forces. Japanese oilers are struck by the first planes from the WASP, which are concerned over their low fuel levels. The rest of the attack waves throw caution to the wind and press the attack, knowing that they might not have enough fuel to make it back. 74,000 American Marines and soldiers are counting on them. As the sun slips past the horizon, the American planes spot the main Japanese force and begin a brutal attack. Japanese defenders hastily take to the skies, and anti-aircraft fire from the ships is intense. Despite this, the attack is pressed, and the planes land several direct hits on the carrier Hayo. The carriers Zuikaku, Junyo, and Chiyoda are also damaged, but not seriously enough to be knocked out of commission. The Hayo, however, slips beneath the waves in hours. As the American forces return home, having lost only 20 planes in the attack, the Japanese battle group takes stock. It's no longer mission effective, and reluctantly, the order to withdraw is given. The fate of the 32,000 Japanese on Saipan has been sealed, but they will not go without a hell of a fight. Back on the island, American forces have pushed the Japanese steadily northwards. The Japanese bunkers litter the jungle, forcing American soldiers to destroy them with the use of flamethrowers and high explosives. Sadly, the civilian bunkers housing the population of 25,000 Japanese residents look exactly like the military bunkers, and many are incinerated or exploded by accident by attacking American forces. A large civilian holding camp is quickly erected, with the lights left on at night in order to lure in other Japanese civilians on the island. After three weeks, American forces have taken two-thirds of the island, and the Japanese are being steadily pushed back. There's no hope of reinforcement, and the Japanese know it. Even if the IJN was capable of braving the resupply run to the island, 
Island against withering American naval firepower, there are few suitable harbors to offload supplies and reinforcements left available to the retreating Japanese. This is now a battle to the death, and the Japanese Bushido Code demands nothing less than total sacrifice. Surrender is not an option. On July 6, Lieutenant General Yoshitsugu Saito, commander of the 4,000 remaining Japanese troops in Saipan, orders all surviving soldiers and civilians to prepare for a final attack. They've been pushed right into the northern beaches, with only the Pacific Ocean at their backs. There is now nowhere to go but forward, into the teeth of the American invaders. As the sun sets, General Saito draws his sword and gives off a mighty roar, Tenno Heika Bansai. The shout is echoed by thousands of Japanese, jolting the Americans to alertness. The final battle of Saipan is about to begin, and it will be hell for both sides. The Americans are shocked at what they see. A group of 12 men carrying a large Japanese flag charge ahead of a massive formation of ferociously shouting Japanese soldiers. Incredibly, behind the Japanese infantry is a steady stream of the wounded wrapped in bandages and on crutches, some of them only carrying sabers or pistols. Amongst the wounded is a horde of civilians armed with nothing more than sharpened bamboo spears. It is a sight no American soldier has ever seen before or since. The attackers crash into the American defenders with unbridled ferocity. A large gap exists between the 1st and 2nd battalions of the 105th Infantry Regiment, 27th Infantry Division, which has been plugged with anti-tank weapons. The anti-tank guns blow holes in the human tsunami rushing at them, but are inevitably overwhelmed. This has split the Americans in two, and quick-thinking Japanese commanders exploit the situation to surround and overwhelm individual American forces. American soldiers and Marines are swamped on all sides by Japanese attackers, and the fighting soon turns into hand-to-hand -hand combat as rifles are discarded for knives or pistols or used as clubs. The violence is extreme, and the Americans are slowly being overwhelmed, one defensive position at a time. Lieutenant Colonel William O'Brien, however, refuses to let his men be encircled. He brandishes dual pistols as he shouts encouragement at his men. He's severely wounded in the shoulder by a rifle round, but refuses to seek medical attention. As the human wave turns and begins to encircle his position, he orders his men to fall back as he rushes into a jeep and jumps behind the vehicle's 50 caliber machine gun. The steady roar of the Ma Deuce covers the retreating Americans until it's finally silenced. Later, when the battle is over, O'Brien's body will be found at the 50 caliber, surrounded by 30 dead Japanese soldiers. Elsewhere, Private Tom Baker has a long run out of ammunition and now uses his rifle as a club. He smashes the rifle to pieces, fending off Japanese, and finally he and his squad are forced to retreat. As they pull back, Baker is wounded and one of his squad mates picks him up, refusing to leave him behind. The soldier carrying him is killed by Japanese fire though, and Baker demands that the rest of his squad leave him behind and not risk their lives for him. They leave him with a pistol in eight rounds and prop him up against a tree. Later, he'll be found dead with eight Japanese bodies before him. However, the Japanese bonsai charge would break on one man who would refuse to budge. Captain Benjamin Solomon was a dentist assigned as a field surgeon. As he treats the wounded inside a medical tent, he spots a Japanese soldier trying to sneak inside under the canvas wall. Solomon throws a surgical pan at the man, then grabs a rifle from a wounded soldier and shoots. Realizing that US forces can't stem the tide of the attack, Solomon orders the aid station to be evacuated and he'll personally cover their withdrawal. Solomon jumps behind a 30 caliber machine gun and begins to lay down withering fire on the advancing Japanese. The steady thumping of the 30 cal rings out as the wounded soldiers and staff make their retreat through the dark jungle. Suddenly, it stops. When US forces return after the battle, they discover Salman's body pierced through with dozens of bullet and bayonet wounds and surrounded by 98 dead enemy soldiers. The attack completely overwhelms American forces and crashes down on the 10th Marine Artillery Battery. The artillerymen are forced to drop their howitzer barrels and fire line of sight directly into incoming human waves. Massive explosions tear through the enemy forces, but still the attack continues. The Marines are forced to destroy their own howitzers to keep them from falling into enemy hands and hastily retreat. Elsewhere, men from the 105th are completely cut off from the rest of US forces and are left with only one option. Ditching their rifle and boots, the men jump into the ocean under enemy fire and begin to swim to US destroyers sitting just off the shore. For 12 hours, the bonsai charge continues until finally the human wave is fully and completely expended. The Japanese have advanced one 1,000 yards into U.S. lines before finally being repelled, fighting to a man and refusing surrender. U.S. losses are high, with 406 killed and 512 wounded. Japanese losses are catastrophic. The entire bonsai attack has been destroyed, with 4,311 dead. In a cave on the beach a mile away, General Saito and his staff commit ritual suicide. The attack will be the largest bonsai charge of the war, and despite the pointless sacrifice, Japan would still lose the war. While the emperor, whose name thousands of Japanese soldiers chanted in their final charge would go on to live a comfortable life before dying of old age.
Want more brutal World War II action? Check out the insane story of the Navy battle that changed World War II, or click this other video instead.